For USCFootball.com, I'm Jack Smith, joined by Chris Trevino for instant analysis from USC's Tuesday practice of Penn State Week. Chris, we knew this was a big one coming into the year, a likely top 10 matchup. Would have been if USC had held on and beat Minnesota last week, but the Trojans fall, they're out of the rankings, and Penn State shoots up to number four in the country. So still a big week for USC, big opportunity, especially with needing to go undefeated probably the rest of the way to make the college football playoff. Big week and a big instant analysis because we've got a lot to talk about today. First things first, we, we wanted to start with practice observations, but Lincoln Riley in our scrum with him started things off with almost a two minute explanation of conversations that he's had with Big Ten replay officials and the officiating crew in general that called the game for USC and Minnesota, some calls that USC disagreed with, mostly that big fourth down overturn call at the goal line that uh, I wouldn't say lost USC the game, but gave Minnesota its game-winning touchdown. Obviously the defining play of the game and anything anyone's really talking about. And Lincoln Riley mentioned, I believe it was earlier this week, maybe on his Thursday call, that US or USC and the Big Ten have been very transparent with him and talking about calls and you know things that happened in the, in the week after the game so obviously he talked about how he called up the Big Ten and they spoke about calls that did not happen specifically he mentioned the pass interference late in the game I'm assuming that's the one on Jalen Smith that they called and then the no call pass interference they had I'm assuming that's the one on Jacoby Lane got hooked on the hip there on the third and fourth throw over the middle that he mentioned as well and the intentional grounding not sure what the clarification was on that but obviously most of that discussion was around the fourth down call we know what happened minnesota attempted to go on the fourth down it was ruled short turnover on downs after the review minnesota was granted the touchdown now the big thing that is here is the undisputable evidence and lincoln riley basically told them that they spoke with the big 10 officials and they quote believed and then he changed it to thought but a believe was his initial word that they believed that max brosner had scored the touchdown but the other part of that is the undis indisputable evidence that he crossed the goal line since they marked it down they must have clear cut proof that the ball crossed the line now you cannot see the ball and he said they agreed with him that there was not indisputable evidence that Max Brosner and the ball or the ball had crossed the line. So obviously it should not have been ruled a score based on the definition of the rule. And he said they he has not been given an explanation as to why that part of the rule that they had the proof, the clear cut proof, reason unreasonable. Uh, there was no doubt in their minds that it crossed the plane. He has not been given an explanation as to why that happened and they quote ignored that part of the rule and it was an unfortunate break for them yeah and lincoln riley first of all wanted to make clear that usc did a bunch of things wrong and also did could have done a bunch of things better in order to win the game he wanted to to make clear he wasn't blaming the officials i don't think he wants the team to think we lost because of the officials they lost for many other reasons but it was a conversation that he had and he anticipated questions which is why he started the press conference by talking about that but that the two words indisputable evidence were kind of the main sticking point where he said if it was called a touchdown on the field he, he probably would have understood if a replay review came back and said hey this stands we can't see the football we're, we're sticking with the call on the field and he said i wouldn't have even called the big 10 offices to talk about it if that was the case but he was upset that the other way around happened and they kind of shook aside the need for indisputable replay evidence to go with what their belief was, which he said, I, I'm paraphrasing, but I don't understand why we got away from the wording of the rule and, and, and why we glazed over that fact in order to just go based off of belief. And when that was kind of one of the things that I noticed during the game. Normally they come back and they say, you know, after replay review, the ruling on the field is overturned or stands or is confirmed. When they came back from the replay review, all they said is, after review, it is a touchdown, which is like they didn't say the normal jargon. They didn't go with the... Oh, hey, we're overturning this call, which makes me, you know, believe even more that they watched the replay said, yeah, we believe he's in. So let's call this a touchdown as if it was a redo for the original call on the field. Uh, so I think as we talked about after the game, shotgun and I on instant, I know you guys talked about it on tunnel vision. USC certainly has a gripe about that call being overturned. Some of the other ones, the intentional grounding, I, I thought might have been intentional grounding. I didn't think Jalen Smith should have been 
flagged for that PI. I mean, the receiver had ran out of bounds. It was kind of incidental hand contact. But if you're going to call that, I think USC was expecting that maybe even a more egregious one on the other side of the field to Jacoby Lane on the ensuing possession should have also been called. So we've been calling for just consistency and whatever the Big Ten is going to do, as well as just following the wording of the rules specifically when it came to that fourth down stop. He also said they admitted that the ball came out. You can clearly see that the ball was popped out, but they don't know when it came out, and obviously they don't know when or if it did cross the goal line. So just a bad break for USC. And, yeah, you're right. He did state that, you know, he does not put the loss on the refs. It was on them that they lost that game, you know, and he called. He said that they have to move past it. You know, they have Penn State this week. They can't dwell on a call that didn't happen. And so that's part of football. You know, calls like that happen, but, you know, the good teams, the great teams, they have to overcome those things. USC still didn't make clutch catches. They didn't still block on critical throws. They still turned the ball over, and those aren't on the ref. You know, that's on them. So, yes, it was a massive, massive mistake call, whatever you want to call it, but – yeah, and it changed the outcome of the game. But he, he mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things that led to that moment where it was put in the hands of the officials and that's ended up being the outcome. So does not blame the officials. Did sound like he was upset, frustrated with them for that, that why they ignored that part of the rule. And I know there's a lot of been people that have been kind of getting on Lincoln Riley that he won't attack the officials, push him in the back a little bit like P.J. Fleck or, or what have you. We've seen him blown up officials. We've seen that happen. You know, the, the Arizona game in his first year, he just goes absolutely ballistic on the official. But if you're trusting in the official to make the call and follow the rule as it is written that there is undisputable evidence, USC stops them. And he doesn't have to, like, go screaming yelling. If there is no evidence that they cross the, ball, they cross the goal line, then USC should have been awarded the ball, turnover downs, tie game, whatever, go down the field, score a field goal, whatever happens, happens. He trusted the officials to do their job. They did not do their job, and that's why we're here talking about it, and he has to talk to the officials. Yeah, I think it takes a lot for, for Lincoln Riley. Now, I don't say it takes a lot to make him upset, for, but it takes him a lot to verbally talk with us about officials, to get in their face about something like that. And most of the time, I think we agree, it's like, the Arizona game was horrible. That was one of the worst segments of officiating I've ever seen at the end of that first half, and it cost USC a possession. And USC could feel like it cost them a defensive stop in this game. I think a lot of people, too, are getting on Big Ten officials in general through USC's first three conference games and comparing it to maybe even being worse than Pac-12 officiating, which USC saw for 100 years. One thing that I will say is Pac-12 officials wouldn't have, you know, talked with USC about this, admitted fault, said, I guess they didn't admit fault, but agree that there wasn't indisputable evidence. I'm not sure you could even really get them on the phone and have these kind of discussions. So I think number. Yeah. Block I, number. I think it's a positive sign that the Big Ten is willing to have these conversations and USC will learn what flies and what doesn't with Big Ten officials as they go through more games in the conference. Minnesota's had umpteen games with Big Ten officiating USC has now had three. So I think you learn a little bit more, hey, what what does a pass interference look like that they will call versus what's one that other teams might think is pass interference, but the referees aren't going to call it. And it changes with every crew, but I think the longer you're in the conference, the more you know what flies and what doesn't. Absolutely. You mentioned it. P.J. Fleck knows these guys. He knows these crews. Lincoln Riley doesn't know these crews. He's They're the new kids on the block. He's the new head coach on the field with these guys getting getting to know them. You know, that was the case when he was in the Pac-12 when he came over from uh, the Big 12. So, yeah, he, he just, there's no familiarity. You know, have to get used to these new fi- new officials and faces and how they call things and their temperaments and all that. So, yeah, just another part of the learning curve uh, first year in the conference. We had a lot of other big news as well today. Another thing Lincoln Riley talked about was Eric Gentry, who missed last week's game. He's obviously been USC's best defender when healthy, but doesn't look like he's uh, getting healthy at least quick enough to potentially play this week. Lincoln Riley agreed with a reporter saying that the terminology of him being out indefinitely was an appropriate word to use and he was asked about the possibility of Eric Gentry using a red shirt this year because he's already played four games he suffered you know a couple of injuries and now has missed an official game and he kind of for the first time disclosed the possibility of Gentry redshirting. Yeah and let's just you know call like it is Eric Gentry has suffered concussions this year and concussions are obviously a big scary word in football and they've sort of changed the entire landscape of how football is covered and how players are protected and you know it's not an ankle it's not a knee it's not elbow whatever it's your brain and that's a scary thing 
for any sort of player to go through. So, yes, there is a possibility that Eric Gentry could make the decision to redshirt this season because if he does not improve in terms of his brain health, you know, that's obviously a thing you need not just for the rest of your life. You know, this is a young man with the rest of his life ahead of him, and you don't want to be putting yourself in danger or risk of doing irreversible damage to your brain. So, you know, it's it's a tough decision. It's a tough position for everyone to be in. Eric Gentry loves playing football, loves his team, playing all-American level football, and USC's defense really needs Eric Gentry. You saw how much they needed him in that Minnesota game, so losing him would be a massive, massive blow for this defense. So, emotional leader, playmaker, one of the few that they have, so they need someone to step up. We don't know really what's going to happen, but if that's a decision that he makes for the best interests of you know his family and his future and his health, you have to respect it because it's it's something very serious. But yeah, that would be a devastating blow for USC and something they just have to fight through. Riley noted that they couldn't say either way whether he was going to redshirt or not going to redshirt, but from the conversation, you know, from what we know about the Eric Gentry situation, it sounds like something they're at least considering to do, even though he wouldn't you know say it clear as day now because the problem is when Gentry plays one more game he loses his inability to redshirt he's already played four so if he feels like okay I'm fine after my concussion I want to I want to come back and play once he steps foot on the field and plays that fifth game if he gets another concussion I don't think that counts as a season ending injury so he doesn't get the medical redshirt so if he plays that fifth game he's out of eligibility correct Correct, and I believe Lincoln Riley called it a day-by-day process and that he is improving, but it's something they're just taking literally day-by-day. They're seeing how he feels day-to-day, week-to-week. He was not out there. He was in street clothes, and so obviously concussion is a different kind of animal, so you have to be super cautious when it comes to that. And, yeah, he would. Maybe we'll see in the future, you know, with football, concussions will be considered a season-ending thing, and that can count for a retro, but as of right now, yeah, that is not – defined as a season ending kind of thing where you can get a medical redshirt. There were a couple guys today that maybe we expected to see in street clothes or potentially not see at all as is normally the case with injured players but they were out on the field fully participating. What did you notice out there? The big one obviously was Anthony Lucas was hobbled walking off the field in Minnesota did not return to the game in the fourth quarter when they really could have used him and potentially they brought out a cart for him to be to be carted off the field with a knee injury but He was out there practicing. He came out in full pads, did not have a helmet, which is kind of strange, but sometimes they have their helmet already in the field, and that looked to be the case. He was out there doing all the individual drills. Obviously, we cannot see all practice, but it seemed like he was a full participant, which is just amazing news for USC, and having dodged a potential serious knee injury, it looks like I would say he's probable for this week. So I I think that's a fingers crossed for him and this USC defense, which if you don't have Eric Gentry, you know, possibly you need a difference maker. And, and Anthony Lucas, who's been playing one of their best defensive linemen. So that was great news. And the other one was Lake McCree was out there in full pads. We literally have not seen him since leaving the state of Michigan, you know, when he was left the field with that knee injury. But he was out there in full pads. You know, Lincoln Riley said he's, you know, getting better, improving. Sounds like he's still a little bit limited. So I'm, I'm game time, you know, very questionable for this weekend if they're going to have him back. Uh, based on the timeline of his, his knee injury, but it's great. It's a great step in general just having him out there in full pads, moving around, and just having a helmet on and doing whatever he needs to do to get back. So the news of Eric Gentry maybe missing this week could be made up by the fact that Anthony Lucas dodged what could have been a serious injury. He was kind of held on one play, got taken to the ground, and it didn't look good. It took him a while to get off. And some of those calls as well are ones that maybe USC fans could have a gripe with. If you see some of the pictures of Anthony Lucas's jersey being held by multiple different guys on multiple different plays, it's just something that USC will learn. But then also, if Lake McCree can come back, that adds a new layer to a USC offense that has struggled to, to figure it out in the passing game. I would say outside of that Wisconsin game and certain plays against Michigan but were there any other main things that you noticed from practice or after interviews today I know that we kind of front loaded it with all of the big information and news dropped during Lincoln Riley's conversations but uh, what else stood out to you today? I, a quote that Miller Moss talked about in terms of you know what he said after the locker room you know they're three and two got Penn State coming to town huge opportunity right you know you beat them maybe you springboard in you go on a run down the line for the season, going a winning streak, what have you, you lose three and three, it could get ugly. So you have this kind of crossroads, and he said there's kind of two paths that they can take. One being they double down on 
who they are and all the work that they put in and how close this team is and they could get closer as a result of this loss. Obviously, you win this game, a lot can change for this team. So they kind of have to look internally. They have to come together. They have to rally. They have to play like their lives depend on it because they do. Their lives do depend on it. They are now a wounded animal, kind of like Michigan was, kind of like Minnesota was. So let's see how they take on that mentality. So I think that was one of the most standout quotes that I heard, that just doubling down on who we are and all the work that they put in. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. There were other small nuggets that you can read in Chris's ghost notes if you're a member on uscfootball.com. You can watch some of the other interviews. We didn't get to talk to as many people today after practice, so if you want to hear what guys like Woody Marks or Kyron Hudson or Jonah Monheim had to say, you can find those here on YouTube. But that'll wrap it up for Instant Analysis today. We'll have another one tomorrow, Tunnel Vision on Thursday, and then the heavily anticipated matchup in the Coliseum between USC and Penn State. But for Chris Trevino, I'm Jack Smith. Make sure you're checking out uscfootball.com for more.